Good morning, everyone. Thank you all for so much for joining this session. I'm joining from Singapore. I understand a lot of uh, participants are also signing in from other jurisdictions. Uh, a warm welcome here. In this webinar, we would like to share thoughts and practical tips on the changes in international arbitration following the COVID pandemic. We all know that this has been the talk of the year, so we don't want to bore your time. So the key for this session is to be interactive and also share your thoughts, as well as the speaker's thoughts, from a younger practitioner's perspective, there to challenge the notions the seniors have suggested. That's the key of this session. So I will first hand over the mic to Sue for her beloved Sue for so that she can deliver her opening remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Sangmin, for giving me the, the time to, to welcome everybody and to thank everybody for participating in this webinar. And of course, my heart warm, more heartfelt thanks to all the speakers here who will be joining on what we had planned to be the debate to your death type of virtual hearing discussion. And I'm sure during our discussion, we'll talk, uh, we'll exchange a lot of very interesting ideas. Um, for my three or four minutes of welcome uh, remarks, uh, instead of talking about KCB in general, which is a topic that I'm sure you've heard in many of our webinars during the week and the webinars we'll have during the week, which this week happens to be the Seoul ADR Festival Week, um, starting, starting on Monday and, until Friday. Uh, but in, instead, my opening remarks, I'll say a few words on KCB Next. Uh, so KCB Next is a, a, a group that was formed back in 2018, about four or five for three, four months after I started as Secretary General. And it was a, a team or group of, of younger uh, practitioners with base or involvement in Korean Arbitration Committee uh, community. And uh, it's really a very free and loose membership where all you have to do is submit your email and they'll put you in our email list so that we can send you invitations to social events, networking events and whatnot. Uh, the people who are planning all these events are the 12 members in the steering committee. Um, of course, not all 12 of them work at the same time. They're all full-time practitioners, well-known people uh, who have very bright ideas um, and are very creative with social events. Uh, the purpose of the of KCB Next was uh, actually socializing and uh, having networking and having a lot of fun. Um, and uh, because the socializing element of the group was so critical, we haven't been able to do that much since March this year for obvious reasons, uh, but we are starting to adapt and evolve to like virtual events. So we've been trying to think of more events that we can meet more people through the virtual platform. Uh, and one of the, I said the main, the main uh, purpose of KCB Next was to create opportunities for the younger participants of the arbitration community to meet, socialize, and network, uh, and have fun. But one of the, the side effects of KCB Next is that uh, we have a higher exposure of people who are bright, experienced, smart, but just haven't had their name out there into the wider arbitration community. And from the KCB secretary's perspective, it's actually a, a great effect of getting to know all these capable but relatively younger arbitrators and um, we've really help, got help from this group because whenever we have those mid to small size sole arbitrator cases and we really want someone who knows all the ropes but just never had uh, their first cut at being an arbitrator, the, the exposure that the young practitioners get through these events has helped us identify the, the powerful candidates. And in fact, there has been quite a, a, a lot of appointments, at least um, within the, the last two years. And that is one of the proud things or one of the things that I am most proud of um, since being a secretary general at KCB, at KCB International. Having new faces and, uh, and uh, new ideas in arbitral proceedings, and that is, has been a great thing, especially in these uncertain changing times, because the newer arbitrators, they are open to trying new things and to adapting new 
things. And this is really important in an area where we have hearings or virtual hearings or hearings that have to be cut into stages because of the, the, the limits to or restriction to travel and to congregating at the same place. So I think this is a opportune, a very good topic and an opportune time for speakers in this KCB Next webinar to discuss what their experience has been, what worked and what didn't, uh, what they would like to see change, and just freely discuss and maybe object to some views of the others, and then maybe collate and synthesize a better solution through this discussion. So um, I welcome you all, and I uh, and I hope to have uh, to have a lively discussion where we can all have a good takeaways to apply in our everyday practice. So thank you and good luck to everyone. Thank you, Sue. Uh, and I, I will begin now with uh, introdu introducing our uh, panelists, uh, all of whom have graciously agreed to um, short introductions, although they're all certainly entitled to much longer, more detailed introductions. Uh, and I'll start with um, our, our Center Square, uh, Professor Jun Gi Kim, who um, uh, Sue mentioned the, the, the newer and younger arbitrators. Um, I, I don't think Professor Kim would be offended if I said maybe he doesn't qualify as a newer arbitrator, but perhaps is one of the <laughs> most respected uh, and uh, sought after arbitrators in Korea and, and indeed throughout Asia. Uh, professor Kim is a, a New York and a DC lawyer uh, who is a professor of law at Yonsei University where he teaches courses in international law uh, at WTO Dispute Resolution, International Trade Law. Uh, and he has served in a number of cases, very many cases, as sole arbitrator, co-arbitrator, presiding arbitrator um, for a variety of institutions, including um, all of the names you would expect it, the ICC, KCAB, SEAC, uh, LMAA, uh, HKIC. Uh, and next we have uh, uh, Sung Hoon Han, who is a, a partner at Lee and Co., um, he is part of the international arbitration team at Lee & Co, uh, is a Korean lawyer, uh, originally also a California lawyer after ha having taken his LLM uh, at Stanford. Uh, he also is a uh, particular expert in labor law uh, and is uh, on the KCAB panel of arbitrators uh, and has extensive experience arbitrating in front of, uh, again, the usual suspects of the KCAB, SEAC, LCIA, ICSID, and the ICC. And I'll now pass over to Songmin to uh, complete the introductions. Oh, well, actually, this already feels like a competition. And I feel like you're cheating already. We agreed to 15 seconds. <laughs> okay, so, so do we have a polling system for this, this introductory ses uh, session as well? No, right? <laughs> I don't believe we do. Okay. Uh, um, Donna Kim. Donna Kim is off counsel at Herbert Smith Freehills and uh, Seoul office, and she specializes in international arbitration. Her, her practice covers commercial arbitration under all of the major arbitral rules, including KTAP, of course. And she spent a number of years practicing in Hong Kong and now in Korea. And and one thing that I have to mention is uh, Donna was awarded the, the practitioner of the year for 2019 of Korea. So that's that's a wow. And so she may, although she may look sweet and soft, but when she's practicing, she, I'm, I would assume that she's very fierce. So you should be careful of her. And the next panelist is uh, Dr. Lars Market. He has a very unique, uh, he's a par pa partner at Nishimura Asai. He has a very unique background. He's, uh, who would believe if I said that he can speak uh, fluent, fantastic Japanese? but actually he can. And he was the winner of the 2020 Lexology Client Choice of Forward for Arbitration and ADR in Japan. He's listed as listed by Asia Law leading lawyers as notable practitioner for dispute resolution in 2020. And if I read all of these awards that has been recognized by all of these institutions uh, and, and uh, organization from his website, I think I need, would need at least uh, 10, 20 minutes. So uh, if anyone's interested, go to the website and please uh, read those things yourself. But from here, uh, I've also had a, I have also experienced working with, uh, had the pleasure of working with Dr. Uh, uh, Lark's market. Uh, and it, I, I can actually say that he was very, very intelligent. 
Okay, um, so I will <laughs> pass this back to Joel. So you are going to introduce how we're going to do uh, the voting system and the polling system. Uh, thank you, Songmin. And, and as Songmin and Sue mentioned, this is intended to be an interactive session. And the first way in which we'll make this interactive is by allowing the participants to choose the topics that we'll discuss. Uh, and we'll do that by opening the first poll now, which is a list of five subtopics we'd like to discuss throughout this session. And uh, please, each participant, choose that topic which you believe is either most interesting or most in need of discussion at a session like this. And once the po polling is closed, we will then discuss the topics in the order of preference among the participants. Uh, as you'll see, there are five topics, which means we're likely not to finish all of them. So choose wisely, as if you have multiple choices, we may not get to, to all of them. Uh, and at the close of each discussion, we'll have a subsequent poll uh, rounding out the discussion on each topic. So as, while, the, while the participants are looking into these subtopics and uh, voting, so Joa, what is your favorite topic? Well, I'd have to say my favorite is probably the virtual hearing versus in, in person, um, because I think that's it's relevant to all of our practice now. Um, but probably the most in need of discussion is how to work with other team members uh, mm -hmm. in a virtual setting. Because uh, to be honest, every con conference I've been to since uh, at least March has had the question of how do you do a virtual hearing and is virtual or in-person better? Uh, but there's not, not a whole lot of discussion about the more day-to-day -day impact on our practice working as teams. So How about you? Uh, so me, then which, which is your well, preference? Well, the fourth topic also was very interesting because originally the how the question was drafted was how to overcome the social distancing blues mm -hmm. because I've seen many people being very, uh, very depressed during the COVID-19. So I was thinking maybe we should all talk about these things and just recognizing the fact that we are all uh, feeling the same depression then maybe it will help each other. So I was interested in the fourth topic, but maybe nobody's actually depressed. Maybe only uh, me, so, <laughs> <laughs> but okay. So uh, I think the result is gonna come out soon. Um, can we have the result now? Oh. Very close <laughs> no, <one. laughs> no, No one is interested in overcoming that. <laughs> Okay, okay, since topic one, two, three is fairly similar, so why don't we start with, oh. Well, it looks like the arbitrator's what? perspective has, oh. has won out in the polling. Oh, the what's, what's, why is it with the color red then? I think it's, I think it's red because it won. Oh, <laughs> okay. And I, I'm sorry, Songmin, but, but your chosen topic, uh, <laughs> had, I was uh, the only one the interested only one in the overcome. In this environment. Okay. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll get uh, personal help from elsewhere. Okay, um, so shall we cover the last topic? But actually, I think the last topic can be covered after we have dealt with other three topics. So why don't we start with the first two, first three topics, if, if it's okay? And then I think the final topic can be uh, covering all the other topic one, two, three as well. So if, if that's okay, it's, that's the discretion of the moderator. So let's do it that way. I think I think that makes sense, and I think the the polling among all four really was was very close. Mm. Okay, so let's start with the first topic then, which is your favorite topic. <laughs> so so uh, Lars, I think you're you're of the speakers at, at the conference. Uh, Song Songmin, of course, is is making us all jealous in the basking in the warmth of Singapore. But of the speakers, you're the only one not. Uh, in, in Seoul. So maybe you could give us the, the Japanese perspective on uh, how you work with uh, your team members virtually. Uh, sure. Um, initially, that, that was quite difficult because uh, we were just used to be all at the office, used to being at the office. And so you would just walk over. And, and so once, once you're sitting at home, you really have to come up with uh, new ways to, to collaborate. So what we initially did is we kind of um, set up kind of a weekly webinar for um, particularly the foreign lawyers at my firm. Um, so, so they had a platform to, to talk. 
uh, we also had uh, weekly webinars or con kind of video conferences for the, the arbitration team members. Um, and of course, then it depends a bit on seniority, but once you're, you're a bit more senior, you really have to think how to make sure you, you involve everybody and give the impression to everybody they're involved. And particularly to the ones you're not working with on a daily basis, you really have to be careful because it, if you're busy, it's, it's, you easily lose sight of someone and, and you don't connect with them for a couple of days. And so that was actually something to actively think of to, to give a call to people, even if you don't work with them on a, on a daily basis, just to see what they're doing, how they're doing, and to catch up. But it's a, it's for very, like, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Uh, but if we compare with that, with the in-person, like for example, lunch, lunch seminar, that's, that's regularly happening in law firms so if you compare that with a, a regular virtual meeting so which one do you in a lunchbox seminar you can have small small chit chats between the people colleague around you but in a virtual setting do you think it to be more efficient for other juniors to speak out or rather a bit more difficult that, that's actually experience? a very good question um and i my experience was that in in kind of video conferences people speak up less um and Actually, after a while, um, I actually looked into to trainings outside of law, how to motivate people to speak up. And, and so mm. nice things was like uh, to have people uh, come up with their own background picture and then explain why they've chosen such a background picture or kind of talk about something not related to law from, from what happened to them yesterday, just to get the discussion going. But, but mm. I agree. Um, in video conferences, it, it sometimes tends to get very difficult to get, especially the junior members uh, to speak and to chime in. Thank you. And I, I think, Donna, because you work at a firm that, that even before the uh, pandemic, you're, you're uh, fairly broadly dispersed around the world. Um, so I wonder if that's made it easier uh, to adapt to the, this sort of uh, remote connecting. And if you have special, uh, uh, approaches you've taken? Yeah, I think it was um, relatively, I think, easier for us because we already um, had this, um, you know, like Skype call um, every day to work with various uh, people uh, within the network. But, you know, the remote working was still um, quite difficult to maintain relationship and network and build, con uh, build connections. Um, connections uh, with our colleagues. So um, what we did is that we started kind of socializing virtual session uh, called mm. virtual coffee roulette. Uh, mm. where, um, we randomly match it for a regular coffee meeting with people across the farm um, at all levels. So you don't know who you will have a coffee together, but uh, for example, our PA was randomly matched with our global CEO and head of China. <laughs> and she uh, complained about it. But I complained about it. <laughs> no good fish, not good feedback. Okay, then that's you so, so you recommend it or you wouldn't recommend it. <laughs> oh, it sounds like a lovely idea. Yeah, wow. it's, but this oh. is popular, and this I think this gave some opportunity to get to um, know some someone new or chat to mm. someone you already know and strengthen mm. the relationship. Um, you can choose like any conversation like social conversation and um, technology and working from home tips and share your mm. story, something like that. I think it's quite important to, to encourage um, people to discuss and share about their challenges both from work and life, um, about what's working well, what's not, what's not working so well. Um, I think these kind of activities have been very useful. Oh, thank you so much for sharing Herbert Smith's trade secret. <laughs> I think that's <laughs> that's very, and that, that could be very uh, helpful actually. Oh. Especially for also Nishimura Asai, you also have many, many branch office all over the world. Now you're, you have an office in Thailand, you have an office in, in definitely Singapore, or Jakarta. So how do you manage the relationship with all these team members that's been in other, other jurisdictions? 
Um, well, it's interesting because I think initially the, the Japanese tendency, and maybe that's similar to Korea, is to meet in person a lot. So um, before the pandemic, uh, people were flying around a lot um, and, and just making sure to, to meet in person, which I still think is the, the best way to, to keep in, in touch and to strengthen relationships. But the pandemic has shown that actually um, by video conferencing, you can meet much easier and also more frequently. So I think that's actually an upside of, of the pandemic that people have realized now. Um, actually, I don't have to wait for three months to fly to Indonesia. I actually can have a, a biweekly meeting uh, just by a video conference. And then I think once things go back to normal, you probably still have the uh, meeting every three months in person. But the, the good thing is now people have realized um, now they all have uh, webcams, they all know how to use Zoom, and they have realized they can actually meet every other week. Mm -hmm. that's, that's, uh, that's actually a good insight, that how, how this may uh, uh, affect our, our practice going forward, even after, uh, if, the, if the current situation does ever end, <laughs> how we'll live after it ends. <laughs> it has to end. <laughs> I, I wonder if we're planning on, on getting to the uh, the four topics, if we should perhaps open the poll on this topic. Mm, uh, yes. Uh, but I, I, uh, Sanghun, I, I, I think uh, you haven't had a chance to, to discuss, and I, 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 I'm skipping over Professor Kim because as a professor, I imagine Professor Kim has fewer uh, uh, colleagues to work in arbitration with other than... Uh, uh, perhaps a tribunal secretary or, or other arbitrators, which we'll get to in the arbitrator perspective. But perhaps while we do the poll on this topic, Sung Moon, if you have uh, mm. uh, thoughts to share, that would be uh, very helpful. So can you show us the poll, poll question? Uh, For well, topic number two, while Sung so, delivers this talk. So like uh, number two, how to work with other team members virtually. Mm -hmm. uh, so right after the pandemic arose, so I encouraged our colleagues, our you know just associates, to buy a webcam and to make themselves, uh, you know, just the uh, familiar with uh, the uh, this kind of system like uh, webcams and Zoom and how to you know just handle these uh, Microsoft Teams. So right right now, what is important is that. Before the pandemic, we had to go through some kind of, you know, things to set up kind of virtual setting, like you know, set your laptops and you know, install the webcams and yeah. But right now, it's it's kind of our daily life. So what is important is that make yourself comfortable with this kind of setting. So you don't have to, uh, you know, install like your separate laptops and install a webcam and you know, uh, install uh, other applications. But just uh, whenever it's kind of the same as having in-person meeting uh, uh, in, in five minutes, just that you can easily access those systems and you always uh, prepare those settings. So I think it's kind of, it has become our daily life that you can do everything virtual and online and remotely. So, and and also in, in, in terms of kind of the, uh, regular meetings and the uh, internal kind of discussions, we have switched it uh, those internal uh, regular meetings uh, into a virtual setting already. So we meet our colleagues, of course, in person, but uh, in, in addition to that, we have uh, regular virtual meetings. And of course, to make those sessions more interesting, uh, for example, we had like a virtual background competition and uh, we we gave kind of prize <laughs> those who have very interesting <laughs> virtual background. So this is kind of way I bet that... you didn't win though, right? <laughs> no, 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 <laughs> no, think, yeah, uh, this, this is one of the worst background, like it's plain, <laughs> not interesting at all, not intriguing. It's nice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so uh, so my kind of tip uh, or experience is that we have to admit that this has already become our like a daily life and the, uh, and, and, and better uh, kind of way to uh, kind of embrace this journey is that just to make yourself uh, in a comfortable with kind of this, this setting. Mm -hmm. Oh, that was helpful. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 
okay. So everyone can see the result, right? So majority of uh, the participants actually said that they would prefer working in the office. And that's quite uh, surprising to me because me being, okay, I have to admit that I will be categorized as uh, in the senior group. So for me, I would love to have my associates and my juniors around me so that I can ask questions and I feel like being interacting with these people. But I just realized that it would, the other way around may not be the same. So I was expecting the juniors to be, <laughs> they would prefer working from home. But oh, this is, this is interesting. Oh, I see. Although, although the way it was phrased, it was, is it more efficient, not do you prefer? I, I can say from my own experience, having been uh, oh. in quarantine twice in, in Korea uh, and not leave the, allowed to leave the house uh, for two weeks at a time each time, I found it much more pleasant to work at home. I also found it somewhat less productive. So less efficient, but better, I think, is, would be my perspective on it. Well, Joel, we have to ask Mrs. Smith Richardson's view as well, of course. Yeah. Well, she would much prefer me to be at the office, I think. It's probably easier for her. She's also more productive with her having a pleasant life when I'm not in the house, maybe. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, uh, I think we have a, a couple of topics to cover. So let's move on to our next topic, which is uh, which, which hearing mode of hearing would you prefer, right? Yeah, and per perhaps Professor Kim, you can, can uh, as uh, an experienced arbitrator who I'm, I'm sure has already encountered virtual hearings uh, uh, several times, uh, could give us your thoughts on, is it better to have a, a virtual hearing or in-person, uh, particularly if, if in-person means waiting and virtual can happen now? Um, I, th I, my, I would say I have to give the quintessential answer that it depends. Um, <laughs> So um, I think definitely for um, a, like a, a side, please. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think yeah, I, I I think it depends because uh, and you'll understand why. For the like the pre-hearing stuff, uh, I think definitely uh, video conference in virtual it makes immense sense. Uh, definitely, I think the uh, telephone conference is out the window now. Um, I think definitely for smaller cases, I think it makes immense sense. Uh, particularly if you have fewer witnesses or and or no experts. Uh, but I think for the bigger cases, the more uh, factually intense, debatable cases where there's lots of controversy going on, I think it makes more sense to be in person. <laughs> um, and um, I, I was informed of a one study that I heard um, they did according to their statistics, um, actually matches what we have is 58% of the people um, preferred in person um, and for multiple very, and a big question of course I have always uh, in this virtual world that we have now, and I've been asking a lot of people about this, is are we more efficient, efficient not prefer, um, if we're in a jet lag state or if we're working at strange hours in the night or in the morning from home or our office. And um, surprisingly, a lot of people suggest that we're actually probably better off in a jet lag state because you can go there earlier, perhaps adjust to the time. And once you get over that, you're fine. But in a constant at home mode, it's actually more, um, kind of wears down on you and the fatigue accumulates even more. Mm -hmm. um, I'll, I'll wrap things up there. There are more things I can talk about, but we should hear from other people. Uh, but just to follow up and just put some pressure on you. So you said it would really depend and depend on the disputed amount of complexity or the length of the hearing. So if you have to, if I force you to come up with a number, so roughly mm. how much, how much the amount, disputed amount or the length of the hearing days. Can you give us some, some rough ideas? <laughs> um, no, I, you know, I think, I mean, you know, because you can have a big case that actually could be very simple and you can have a smaller case that could be very complex. Um, so I, again, I'm sorry to say this and you're not going <laughs> to like this, but case by case. <laughs> um, okay. 
Okay. Yeah, I, I, I think it's. I think that's a good lawyerly answer. I, I can yes, say from my yes. experience, I mean, <laughs> during one of my lockdown periods, I I sat as an arbitrator in a, a virtual hearing without witnesses with parties in Vietnam and Korea, and that was the perfect solution. Mm. Uh, I'm now planning a remote hearing uh, where I'm considering traveling uh, halfway around the world to still do a virtual hearing, but to be in the same location as the witnesses. Mm. So. I think it makes, I think it's very much a case by case from my, from my perspective. I, I agree. Yeah. The, the hybrid mode, I think is also, um, you know, that's another interesting thing where you have the tribunal members might be together or certain witnesses and counsel might be together. So there's all, it's not actually just one or the other. There's also that hybrid mode, which I, I think also makes a lot of sense in certain given situations. Hmm. Oh, and the result came out while we were talking. So 73% of the audience preferred having in-person hearings. Mm. Mm. And I would also, mm. I, I would think that there could be two more reasons, a, a couple of more reasons, but one or two reasons that I can think of is actually the beauty of uh, international arbitration is actually you can fly and travel all, all around the world. But most of the senior arbitrators around me, they said that now they are sick of traveling and they really pretty much enjoy the virtual hearing because they don't really have to travel. Which are the, the people group there who are not really uh, enthusiastic about uh, traveling to another country. But for me as a, a junior, and still, even still till now, I think uh, to attend the hearing, to go to another jurisdiction in itself is very interesting and very good. So I think that's one of the reasons. The second one is even though you cannot follow your seniors to an in-person hearing, uh, if it's an in-person hearing and your boss is away for a couple of weeks, that's already good already for juniors. So that could be, <laughs> <laughs> that, that could be another reason. Hmm. But yeah, I, okay. I wonder if I can, can put a politically in incorrect <laughs> question to, to, to Sanghoon. I've, I've noticed uh, a similar pattern that among a younger audience, there tends to be much more enthusiasm for the in-person hearing. Uh, and when you get to a more senior audience, uh, particularly among practitioners, I think clients uh, seem to be um, in a similar percentage regardless of the audience. But uh, among practitioners, it seems to be the younger people want to travel, the, the more senior arbitrators prefer uh, virtual. Uh, what, what's your thoughts on is, is it? Is that a legitimate experience? Uh, is that uh, perception borne out in, in your experience? And if so, why? So I think it, it varies uh, depending on the uh, case circumstances and whether you have uh, like a strong case, weak case, whether you have a case where your, uh, uh, your, your, your client, your party uh, wants to draw some kind of sympathy from the uh, tribunal. And like you said, some client might prefer to have virtual hearing because they can save cost, right? You, you don't have to send your like a whole team to Europe or North America, and then you, you you can save a lot of money. But I have a case where our client actually wants to uh, push uh, in-person hearing because th this is the case that they want to draw kind of sympathy from the tribunal. They want to show that they are like old, Korean man who's crying in front of the tribunal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I have to ask, would that help? <laughs> Professor Chung Kim, would that, would that approach help if, if a Korean man is crying with, or Dr. Lars, would that actually help? Your Frank, do you want this before we move on to the next stuff, please? <laughs> would that help? Well, I mean, we're, we're, we're depends, all people, again. of course. <laughs> case so, by case. Uh, yes. well, well, <laughs> And and um, also, uh, please go ahead, uh, Professor Kim. No, 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 go ahead, Jeff, please. And and also, uh, another problem uh, I have encountered is the uh, time zone issue, and this is also matters about uh, a, a matter of equality of arms and fairness. So I have a case uh, which involves the uh, party from North America and party from uh, London, and and so uh, if we uh, turn the dial uh, into tribunal's time zone, then. The time window we have is only four hours every day from midnight to 4 a.m. In, in Korea. And we should do it for like two weeks. So we are really uh, <laughs> strongly opposed to that idea because that's not something we, 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 we can uh, never do. So there is no kind of concrete answer uh, as to uh, uh, what kind of, uh, you know, just, uh, uh, you know, 
what what kind of setting is is better in terms of virtual hearing or in in person hearing? So it varies, uh, uh, in in respect to the uh, like you said, the size of the case and the party jurisdictions and the, whether you have, uh, you know, a, a witness and that improves uh, interpretation. So I think that's kind of issue that the councils should consider uh, uh, considering uh, various factors. Hmm. If I could just add uh, one thing that I've been um, experiencing and I've been suggesting to parties um, and that others are actually more receptive than I expected is uh, we breaking out of the mindset that the hearing has to be four or five hours continuously. Um, so what I, I've, um, I've been proposing to parties is why not break it up, particularly across time zones, and I have a similar, very similar situation, Sang Huns, where actually the time zones are from Central America all the way to where we are. Um, so it was virtually impossible to get five hours straight. So what I proposed is to break it up. So you have like two hours in the morning, depending on where you are, and then two hours or three hours later on. And I think that actually might work out better for everybody. Um, but I'm waiting to hear the response. Mm. Uh, actually, that is related to it, that. Uh, that raises one interesting question or comments that have been recently he heard from my client is because virtual hearing it's more flexible and it is considered to be easier, cheaper. Uh, 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 if we compare that with an in-person hearing, because the entire team needs to travel together with the team, the client's team as well. So in that, and so some clients were complaining that as actually because of the fact that it's more easier and cheaper, so it puts less pressure on the other side or their own side to settle. So mm. it's actually, uh, it act actually is not really, in that perspective, not always the best thing for from the client's perspective. That was one interesting opinion, comments that I received from my, one of my mm. clients. Moving yeah, back to um, Joel. Mm. Oh, oh, I don't know. Yes, Professor Chungi. Yeah, yeah, yes, 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 please. The, the cost issue is actually it's very complex, and I've actually heard a lot of discussion on this. And as actually, some people suggest that virtual is actually deceptively very expensive. Mm -hmm. um, because, for instance, the simplest thing, of course, we have to factor in is, um, you know, um, the vendor cost, um, the preparation cost, um, the planning cost. Um, this is actually much more immense than people actually think about it. You think it's just turn on the video and everything happens. Mm. But behind the scenes, as we all know, um, I have to look at, you know, that time and date time zone planner like every other day <laughs> to try to make sure all the time zones work out. Mm. Um, just the planning, working out with, if you have interpreters, experts, multiple locations, the technical stuff. Uh, if, you, if you add all that in, Actually, some people suggest it's actually not that cheap. <laughs> mm, um, I, so it'll, it'll, I think it'll depend on the case as well. Right, right. I, I, I think it also factors into uh, um, so, some lawyers, not not me, but some lawyers uh, <laughs> fill the billable time to to, uh, to meet the time required. So if you have a, a two week virtual hearing uh, versus a one week in person hearing. Uh, you'll not only have the vendor costs, uh, but you'll also have a lot more attorney time because mm. you essentially will, will spend every available minute preparing uh, just so that you feel as prepared as possible. And if that's two mm. weeks of available time versus one, uh, that's a lot more um, a lot more attorney time that the client gets billed for. I totally agree. Yes, yes. And and I think there is one very uh, practical kind of issue in terms of the cost because, uh, as you know, the most of the arbitration cases uh, go on a, like a big gap basis, and the, the big gap includes assumptions. For example, the hearing does not uh, it, it exceed like a five five days like that. No, 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 Sang Hoon, Sang Hoon. Before you, there is no. It's not capped. We should not make that to be like a. <laughs> A norm. It's, it's not. No, of course. Time chart hourly basis is the norm. It's it's a normal thing. Some exceptional cases. Yes. If you have yes. a good relationship with the client. Yes. Okay. So okay. so okay. Back okay. To you. Okay. Okay. So uh, we have some uh, exceptional cases where we work on figure basis, right? <laughs> yeah. But the problem is that the uh, uh, 
uh, there are uh, assumptions, for example, like yeah, the, the hearing uh, does not exist like a five, uh, five days like that. Of course, those assumptions were assumed before COVID-19. But now uh, there are cases, there are situations where we, uh, we need to do like a hybrid or like a full virtual hearing. Mm -hmm. And then of course we cannot finish uh, the uh, whole hearing within like five days for sure. Then it, it, ca it carries over next week. So we assume like two weeks or 10 working days. Then clients comes back to us and that assumption can still stand. <laughs> <laughs> then, yeah. So, uh, from our perspective, of course, we we need to spend like a two, four two weeks for the preparation mm -hmm. and you know adjusting time zone. So, I think that's kind of a practical kind of issue in terms of cost. So, from now on, uh, uh, the the cases that I uh, you know just did, uh, have started working on after the COVID nineteen, that I try to insert separate kind of uh, assumptions in terms of hearing date. Mm -hmm. If it's in, in, uh, oh, if it goes uh, in person hearing, like uh, five working days, but hybrid or virtually, like you know, uh, you know, just more than six hours a day, mm -hmm. but yeah, up to like two weeks. So I think that's kind of practical issues that mm -hmm. I encountered. Yeah. Yes, uh, I totally agree because I all, all I, I think uh, I totally agree with what we all said. If the uh, the life of us are, are us as a lawyer practitioner, if we have a, a certain amount of time, we tend to use all of that time because we don't want any stone to be unturned. It's the life of a lawyer. So I think it, it becomes like uh, that. So I totally agree. Yes. Well, unless you have sufficient cases that keep you busy at the same time, uh, <laughs> <laughs> to work on the other case uh, as well. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I think, I think since we've wrapped in really the, the arbitrator perspective into, into this comment, maybe we have time to extend a little and, and, and invite Donna's comments on mm. uh, the virtual versus uh, in-person divide. Yes. Oh, you're oh, on, you're uh, on mute, mute, Donna. And after Donna, maybe we can do, show, do the voting again on the same topic because we talked a lot on the topic <laughs> again. So we, can see we see? If we see? <laughs> Okay, back to you, Dana. Uh, okay, um, I think the, the after my first uh, virtual hearing, the, the first thing people said after the hearing is that they're all very exhausted. It's because that they had had to continuously stare at the screen for hours and mm. experience physical tiredness caused by you know eye fatigue and limited movement, and uh, people you know cannot even you know get up for a coffee because they can be look like they're distracted and uh, uninterested. So um, they feel really, they felt the first comment they um, provided is that we are all very exhausted. And especially when you see the multi-person screens like this um, and multiple eye stimuli that appear on the screen, it will challenge your brain as well because you have oh. to test um, all the like information at once. So that's that also can cause kind of mental exhaustion as well. Mm. So, um, I think I had a like um, virtual mediation uh, about a month ago, and then we had to look at like twenty people, more than twenty people at once on the screen. Um, so in that kind of situation, it, it was kind of you know challenging. But I think we can try to you know stop like multitasking during the session and reducing on screen stimuli such as like email notification and the calendar calendar mm. reminder these can kind of help to ease the tiredness and mental stress level mm. that is something you know I we experienced and as discussed we probably need to set you know protocols for shorter days of like four to five hours um, day um, hours hearing per day and more um, regular break up breaks mm. the hearing um, so these are some difficulties and something we try to um, overcome. But I think um, even if there is there are some disadvantages to virtual um, arbitration, I think it's quite um, now is a kind of commonplace. Mm. Even before pre-COVID, and even if we are being kind of pushed to do more virtual hearings than before, it is true that I think it gives us gives us more opportunity to take initiative and experiment alternative measures to overcome the current challenges. Mm. I, I I also agree. I, one thing I miss about really miss about uh, in persons hearing is that well, body language actually matters. So if the, the other side witness is talking. 
and and they they're testifying but then all of a sudden the other side especially the juniors who have been actually preparing prepping the roots if they get like suddenly busy and they're just looking into certain documents you know that something is going on and that's actually a very good sign for us to carefully look into that uh, witness testimony again so these kind of body language and i'm, I'm pretty sure that the tribunal also would be uh, paying attention to those body languages, but those things are very limited in, in virtual hearings. So you can only see the person who's cross-examining. So the people who are who have been working together uh, to prep the witness, it's something. And, and also, if the other side is asking rude questions, and then sometimes you, even though you're not uh, as doing the cross-examination, you can show some body language like. <laughs> To, to actually just just like intimidate a little bit the other side, if possible, not that I'm doing that, but those things like the fun in, in real in-person hearing is slightly missing in virtual hearing. So that's something, yes. Uh, I yeah, I about. totally mm. agree with you. Mm. The, the, another thing I felt during the hearing is that the hearing is, is kind of another opportunity for the parties to assess whether um, their opportunity about settlement as well. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. They, they want to see, you know, whether there is a chance to settle the matter. And so they want to kind of like look at the other side the reaction when they mm. present the case mm. and just like a body language or something like, mm. like that. But mm. they, you know, you will have limited opportunity or kind of limitation to do that because mm. you only see their faces the basic expression is all you can read. Mm -hmm. so, um, that was kind of like challenges we um, right. experienced. So for Lars, in, in working in a, in, a, in a special environment like Japan, so people, do you think that there would be less opportunity for Japanese clients to settle if there is like in a virtual hearing more? Or do you think the tendency, like the culturally mm -hmm. would I think I think the the real professional companies, if they really want to settle and explore settlement, they they still will find ways to do it. But I would agree that um, I had hearings for basic basically the the CEOs of both companies met in the hallway during the hearing, and they said mm. like our both of our lawyers are idiots. Like why don't we? Take <laughs> and, and basically they they settled the case and. That that is uh, now much more difficult. Um, that that chance meeting you have, and and also the 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 time when they, before the hearing they need to kind of face each other and shake hands, where uh, mm. you can kind of normalize the relationship a little bit. Um, that's missing. So I I that that has got more difficult. But I think still for uh, professional corporations that are advised uh, properly. Um, it's you, you're lacking this chance moment, but um, I don't think that precludes uh, settling. Mm. So, Joel, shall we look at the poll result again? The same yeah, question. Shall we, shall, we, oh. shall we take the uh, poll? Uh, can we load that poll one more time uh, to let the uh, participants vote again and see if uh, anyone's mind changed? Their mind. <laughs> I'm not going to say how I answered last time or how I'm answering this time. <laughs> <laughs> maybe maybe we should have added an option for it depends for uh, Professor Kim. <laughs> <laughs> I just I just hope, Professor, that when you sit as an arbitrator, you don't vote in the same way. <laughs> Let me respond. Then it depends. <laughs> In, in the It'll article, world. depend on the case rule. <laughs> ah, okay, well that's fair enough. Oh, oh, now now people prefer virtual hearing a bit more. Yeah, I think it's up from. Uh, I think it had been uh, <laughs> uh, about twenty eight or twenty nine before. So, all oh, right, a slight move in favor of uh, virtual hearing. Oh, okay. <laughs> So maybe we should move on to the uh, to the last topic, which is yes. uh, how to deliver your case uh, efficiently through the virtual se setting. Mm -hmm. uh, tips and know-how. I think we've we've all kind of acknowledged that uh, to a certain extent, uh, Professor Kim is right that it does depend, and there do have have to at least for now be virtual hearings. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I wonder, Donna, if you'd like to kick off this uh, discussion of of how to best present your case or or things you. You see, done wrong. We could should be done differently in presenting a case virtually. Yeah, I think um, probably um, from you know arbitrators and counsels' perspective and 
I think each party should be given the full opportunity to uh, present their case, even if they have a virtual hearing. So it is quite important that parties are satisfied of the equality of the, um, the procedure and no party should feel that they're unfairly prejudiced by the virtual um, format of the hearing. So um, as, as I discussed, there are some you know, protocols including whenever, you know, people tend to uh, postpone hearing more when they um, have substantial or sub very substantial arbitration, including um, cross-examination of witness um, or expert um, witness um, examination. But um, in that case, um, there can be a protocol um, which required the door to the room is visible so that the witness can give a 360 degree view of the room um, before the uh, before giving evidence so that there is no um, kind of coaching or um, interference by the other parties. So they make sure that everyone has, um, have uh, make sure that they have a um, fair and full opportunity to pre present their case. Um, I, th I think that's one um, thing um, I observed. And there is, of course, um, when you present your case, you have to make sure that um, you, in the, on your screen, you, you uh, make sure that you, are, you have a pro appropriate lighting and professional looking background and speaking very clearly, um, not necessarily too long. And in case of any um, time lag and putting on mute using headphones to keep focus on and, and to constantly remind yourself that you're on camera, even if you are not speaking. I would have. I would love to ask Professor Kim's, uh, Jungi Kim's opinion, which which was the most efficient uh, way to deliver your advocacy through a video conferencing recently. Uh, have you experienced? And and if you think, oh, someone's coming into my room. Okay, so uh, or or can you actually share some of the experience? <laughs> No. You thought that was a worst tip, so you should you would, you would discourage councils to uh, take that approach. I, I think uh, Donna talked touched upon it um, a while a, earlier, but I think one of the big factors uh, we all have to keep in mind is, is the fatigue factor. And um, actually, of course, I, I find that if you're the speaker, of course, because you're delivering your where your views, you're, you're kind of wrapped up in your views and you're, you're, you're more, more involved and engaged. It's actually, and you're the proactive one, um, you're, you're more energized, but actually from the other side of the table, if you have to stare at a screen for hours and hours and hours, um, it gets overwhelming. And um, I, I have a great quote um, that I found from a Roman lawyer in the first century, guy named Quintilian, and I'll just paraphrase it. Just basically, this is the first century, so 2,000 years ago. Conferencing. Yeah, we, we, we must not always burden the judge with all the arguments we have discovered, since by doing so, we shall at once bore him or her and render him or her less inclined to believe us. Meaning, basically, uh, in a virtual setting, and of course, this applies in an in-person setting, everything's magnified. So short is better. Uh, keep it to the essence. Um, Sung Min actually <laughs> uh, mentioned that she doesn't want to leave any stones unturned, but maybe some of the stones you should just leave. <laughs> Please. Um, you know, I normally please. I don't stone the terms. I ask my juniors to turn over this. Well, of course, the Sung Min only reveals the gems and the diamonds and the emeralds, but there the are some rocks the opposite. there that the, you, the juniors yeah. discover the gems. The opposite. Uh, and, and just and I think the 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 impulse to throw the kitchen sink at the tribunal gets magnified in a sense in a virtual setting, and you really got to refrain from that because it's that the tribunal will get lost and it's it, it actually it's not it doesn't help your case and it can be counterproductive in many times so mm -hmm. short and simple <laughs> to the essence um just unearth these the gems i think that would be my my summary 
Oh, that's very important. Very important. Well, well, unfortunately, I mean, it still it remains difficult for the responding party because you need to be prepared for whatever stones might be overturned, uh, even if they some will be left unturned. Uh, so be, be careful if I'm the claimant. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, did you have thoughts to add? Uh, so, yeah, just to, to uh, follow up uh, Professor Kim's kind of, you know, just the uh, view, I think how we can deliver our case efficiently uh, through virtual setting is the matter of how we can hold a viewer's attention during the uh, uh, virtual hearing, which can last, you know, five, six hours looking at your own screen. I think virtual hearings are not that different from in-person hearing. For example, if order advocacy itself is not interesting or like intriguing, uh, even in in-person hearing, of course it is hard to keep the tribunal concentrated for hours in a virtual setting. So, what counsels I think bear in mind uh, in virtual hearing is same as in in-person hearing. Uh, that is, for example, it is important to understand the technology and use the platform actively and make sure that all parties can be seen and heard and know how to handle the document, avoid over speaking, and they, uh, make the best use of demonstrative materials such as PowerPoint slide so that you can uh, have the travelers uh, consideration and hold their attention uh, during the whole virtual hearing uh, setting. I, I, I wonder, Lars, as uh, a former DJ and, and therefore the only person here with extensive uh, <laughs> headphone learning experience, is, is there a right or wrong for, answer to for the, the question next case, of should each participant have their own headset uh, if they're speaking or should there be a, a room speaker and microphone? Um, so, so my... <laughs> that, that's an interesting intro lead-in into headset questions. Uh, the, the, the thing is, um, if people speak from their own rooms, um, I don't think they necessarily need headsets. But I, I had the issue where I had a team of lawyers sitting in a, a hearing room um, that weren't using headsets, but they were, in, they were using um, individual laptop computers to dial in. And then they had, on top of that, the room microphone. And that didn't work out at all. So eventually, and, and also that was really hard to fix. Um, so eventually the parties gave up on, on using that hearing room and, and went back to their offices. And so fortunately we did a test run and to, to figure that out. Um, so if, if you have multiple people in a room, you really have to be careful about the sound overlap. Uh, and then I think headsets are in order. And the good headsets actually, they, they do make a better sound. Um, and if you're speaking for a long time and you want somebody to listen to you, that's probably a good idea to, to, to use one. Um, but if, if you have a, a good microphone in your laptop built in or in your camera um, and you're in, in, your, in a room by yourself, I think that's fine as well. Maybe, maybe if I may add one comment uh, on, on Sang Hoon, uh, the use of documents, I think that is, that is one thing in virtual hearings, which which I found sometimes difficult. Um, if for me as counsel, if I want to make the tribunal aware of a document, that's sometimes difficult because if you screen share, uh, you don't really know how big the screen is the the tribunal is looking at. Uh, so sometimes the the writing might be too small, and uh, mm. whatever you want to show them gets lost. Mm. So. Very often we had kind of a second electronic bundle that the tribunal has for itself on the second screen. And mm. you can then tell the tribunal, please look at the, the third line. This is a really important mm. word in that, that paragraph. Um, and on the other side, as a tribunal, what I found very difficult and exhausting is if um, counsel try to take us through five different documents to make one single argument, um, because you, yeah, you, you get lost. So if, if it's like, okay, now please look at exhibit five, C5, and we compare this with exhibit R10. And now we still need to take a, a third exhibit on top of that uh, mm. C17. And that is already difficult in an in-person hearing. Um, but 
Oh, we were getting out. <laughs> While Lars is sharing his tip. <laughs> it's a kind way of, of telling me I've spoke too long. Uh, but so that, that's my tip. Uh, be careful with the use of documents in virtual hearing. That can be difficult. Very helpful. Very helpful. Okay, so since now we are already reached, uh, I think you're on mute, Joel. Huh. I am indeed, and I was just going to agree that that's very, very oh. uh, helpful and a very good point about documents. The, wow, uh, the result yeah. came out. And, and the participants agreed, Lars, that was a very good point about Very documents. good point, yes. <laughs> Don't take us to five documents while making one argument, okay. <laughs> so I, I think the posting of that poll was a, a hint to all of us as the moderators and, and speakers that we've reached the conclusion of our hour uh, to speak with the uh, participants. Um, so on behalf of Songun and myself, I'd like to thank uh, all of the participants uh, and all of the speakers for what has been a very interesting discussion. Uh, and I'll invite uh, Songun if she'd like to make some final closing remarks. No, um, put, uh, 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 my last chance <laughs> to put someone on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you so much for your time, all of the speakers and the audience. Thank you so much. And please enjoy the rest of the week where we have very many, uh, many, many interesting uh, programs. Uh, this week. So please participate as much as you can while it's cheap because I think normally in person uh, seminars can be very uh, expensive, but for this, this time because of COVID <laughs> and the Zoom, please uh, try to use that platform to uh, access to the, these great contents. Have a great week and have a great day as well. Thank you so much. Right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.